Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Learn With Me. I'm Deborah Hansen. Today, we're going to look at 3.5 communication and language development. So we're going to go through the CED question. There's two of them for this particular section of Unit 3. I'm going to look at the essential knowledge you need to know to be able to answer both of those questions. If you're liking the content, please hit that subscribe button for me. I really appreciate it. And I love seeing the numbers go up. Okay, let's get going. Okay, so we're going to start off. There's always the key terms for this particular section of the unit, and I'll do a separate video on those where I'll go through the definition and real life examples so that you can make your flashcards or whatever, however you decide to keep your key terms. Whatever you do, you do need to have some sort of a system where you're learning the key terms, where you're memorizing them basically, and you're able to apply them to situations when you get to the FRQs or MCQs. Okay, let's start with the question number one, which is explain how key components of language and communication apply to behavior and mental processes. Okay, let's have a look at this. So we're going to look at the key components of language. So we're going to have a look at phonemes and morphemes, which are basically the building blocks of language. So let's start with phonemes. So what does this mean? The definition is that it's the smallest unit of sound in a language. So for example, the word cat that has three phonemes, k, a, t, that's your phonemes. What kind of behavioral impact does that have? Well, children learn phonemes as they develop language, which helps them distinguish between different words, okay? So that helps the sounds that they're making. On the other hand, we have form, morphemes, sorry, morphemes. And the definition for that is the smallest units of meaning in a language. So for example, the word unhappiness has three morphemes, un, happy and ness. So we break those down and each section of that word has a different meaning. So how does that affect the mental processes? Well, understanding morphemes helps people create new words and understand complex meanings. I'm sure this has happened to you even when you're studying for, for example, the SAT. And we have a lot of really tough words right now in the SAT. But sometimes when we break it down, we can actually find the meaning of the word within the meaning of the word by, by looking at the morphemes in that particular word that you have. And that's a really good skill, by the way, when you get into that uh, vocabulary section in the SAT. Okay, now we're going to look at semantics versus syntax. Okay, so if we're going to start with semantics, so semantics basically is the rules for deriving meaning from words and sentences. For example, knowing that run can refer to both physical movement and also an event, like for example, a run of good luck. It depends on the understanding of the semantics. So what kind of cognitive impact does that have? Semantics plays a role in how people interpret language and then comp and then convey the complex ideas. And this is important to always know, especially when we're writing, because sometimes we pick words that we think sound right, but they don't fit the context of whatever you're writing. So it is, does come down to the semantics of that. Syntax, on the other hand, is the set of rules for arranging words in a sentence. So for example, in English, the syntax follows a subject verb uh, or sorry, subject, verb, object, order, as in she eats an apple. What kind of behavioral impact does that have? Well, syntax helps people organize thoughts into understandable sentences and improves communication and idea expression. Here you even have on the slide, for example, an arrangement of words in a sentence, the man walks the dog versus the dog walks the man. So it's really about how you're, what you're trying to get across in the sentence and what syntax you're going to use to organize what you're trying to say. Okay, then we're going to go into grammar. Now, we all know about grammar because, of course, we're all graded on it every time we do an essay or anything, especially in English class. So let's look at grammar. That's the rules that dictate how sentences are structured in a language, basically. So, for example, in English, the sentence, the cat is on the mat, is grammatically correct. But the mat the cat is on, on is is not. So we, we know that we have to structure our sentences in a specific way so that it makes grammatical sense. Okay, so what is the mental processes for that? Well, basically understanding grammar helps people produce and comprehend languages effectively. So we, it, grammar is important. I know, I know your teachers say this, but it really is. You really do need to be able to understand the grammar to be able to write um, accurately. Okay, let's look at generativity of language. So I got to love this, this image that I that came up with here. But anyway, the Generativity of language is basically that language is generative, which means it can produce an infinite number of ideas and sentences. For example, people can create entirely new sentences they've never even heard before, such as, 
the purple dinosaur flew over the city with a sandwich. I forgot to put the sandwich in this guy's hand. <laughs> but anyway, what kind of cognitive impact does that have? Well, generativity allows for creative expression and complex thought, and it supports problem solving and abstract thinking. Okay, so that was the first CED question for this particular section of unit three. The second CED question is explain how language develops in humans, okay? So we're going to look at now the states of language development. So first of all, nonverbal communication for first the first thing we'll look at. Manual gestures. Across cultures, infants and young children use gestures like pointing to communicate before they even develop a formal language. But then we have the language development that appears in stages. So for example, cooing around two to three months. Well, infants will produce sounds like ooh or ah, or you've I'm sure you've seen a little babies do that, right? And then we go around go to babbling, which is around the four to six months. And they're starting to combine consonants and vowels, baba, dada, mama. All of those are basically what is starting to happen. Babbling is common in all cultures and is the precursor to speech. Then we get to the one word stage around 12 months. Infants start using single words to communicate meaning, pointing to the dog, dog, cat, mama, that kind of idea. Then we get to the telegraphic speech, which is around 18 to 24 months. So the toddlers now are beginning to form two word sentences. Sometimes they'll omit the smaller words. For example, they say want juice or go park or uh, want toy. So they'll, they won't have the whole sentence, but they're going to, they're starting to put those words together to communicate better. The speech is efficient like a telegram. It conveys the essential meaning. Okay. The last that last slide we're going to look at here is the errors in language development. Okay, so overgeneralization, for example, that's when children apply a language rule that's too broad. For example, a child might say, I goed to the park instead of I went to the park. It overgeneralizes the past tense rule by adding ed to all verbs. And why is this important? Well, these errors reflect that children are actively learning and applying the rules of language. And as children are exposed to more language, they gradually will correct these errors and develop a more sophisticated understanding of grammar and syntax. And those are the two questions for 3.5 communication and language development. So this is the essential knowledge that was in the CED that you need to know. There's a few other things that you'll, you'll probably need to know, but we'll put those in the key terms video as well so that you can get the understanding of those words. If you like the content and you want to hear more, hit the subscribe button. You'll get notifications when I add more of these videos. I'm going to do the key terms video for 3.5 as well. And I'm just going to keep going with three, four, and five of the new AP curriculum. So if you're studying for a test, just a unit test or if it's for the AP exam. Wish you the best of luck and I'll see you next time.